Um, thank you all for being here. I'm particularly very pleased to have our four speakers and I mean our panelists today. So my name is Ashok Das. I am an associate professor in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And uh, I also serve on the executive committee of the Center for South Asian Studies here. So I'm very pleased to have you all here. Uh, it would have been even better if it were in person, but hopefully we'll revert to that soon in one of the coming years. <laughs> so anyway, so I think we have got two, uh, four, four very exciting papers here today. And um, uh, just so I, one second, yeah. Um, so the the panel is uh, is living with floods, in which is uh, an increasingly sort of clear and present danger in the region of the world that we're talking about. And so we have four pa papers. Uh, the first present is going to be Leonie Kona from the University of Manchester. Then we have Anushka Taula Jan from the Western University in Toronto, in Canada. We have Bikash Chetri from University of Cape Town, and then finally our own Daniel Adel who's from uh, the geography department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So without further ado, I would like to invite Leonie to get started. And I will probably give you maybe, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, so Leonie, how are you doing the, okay, you I'll, will do that. I'll chat, I'll send a message for a five chat, yeah. So just, just sometimes look at your chat window because I tend to get distracted and not look at that. <laughs> so, and I think you'll get uh, a five minute or three minute warning from Saloni. All right. So I will stop speaking and I'll invite you to take over. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the organizers and the fellow panelists at this week's um, conference and symposium. It's really interesting. And I've, I've just sat in the previous panel um, and yeah, completely different from my own research. So really good to get all of these different uh, presentations together. So thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Um, thumbs up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. So um, thank you for having me. My name is Dr. Leonie Connor. I'm from the University of Manchester. And um, I was actually attracted to this symposium because it's quite outside of my usual area of research. Um, I am focused on kind of South Asian security more broadly, um, but my research is very interdisciplinary. I'm kind of sat between the intersections between, you know, international relations theory, human rights, um, kind of conflict studies, I don't know, a bit of everything. Um, but for this particular uh, paper, and the reason I wanted to come and talk to you today is because I actually kind of diverted a little bit, kind of post PhD, um, into looking at what I'm going to talk to you um, today about. So what I wanted to do in this paper, it is a work in progress, by the way, so um, please go easy on me. It's kind of in the pipeline. Um, but I wanted to try and understand or at least try to figure out what the influence of climate change is on conflict zones. So, um, you know, we kind of see the destructive force that climate change has had, definitely in the previous panel, um, in different ways, shapes and form. But what I wanted to know more about is this relationship. Well, OK, we have, you know, we have these different consequences of climate change, whether that's kind of floods, which is what we're talking about today, or, you know, kind of earthquakes or whatever it might be. Um, but I kind of had a question mark around, OK, well, you know, it disrupts a normal society, if we can call society normal. Um, but what does it actually do for uh, communities and people that find themselves already struggling with an ongoing conflict zone? And then on top of that, they have, you know, like the catastrophe of a flood. Um, so it's very much interdis interdisciplinary by nature. Um, so obviously it's kind of at the moment trying to look at the literature around climate change, around kind of floods and disasters um, and what that looks like, but then also trying to understand, well, what does climate security look like? And then trying to tie that to literatures on the conflict in Kashmir and um you know the kind of security studies and IR literature that follows on from that so very much kind of grappling with all these different things trying to bring it together under one conversation um and see you know what what does what kind of knock-on effect does this have um so yeah it does draw a lot on or at least definitely some of the preliminary findings that I did um having the PhD and I did have conversations around climate change during my PhD although it wasn't related to my primary research question um you know kind of through snowballing and through kind of semi-structured interviews I got to talk to participants about their experiences and they kind of related 
obviously this was prior to the 2022 floods, but this related back to previous experiences of um, floods and other issues around climate change that they had um, that had impacted on their day-to-day -day lives. So what did my thesis do then? Well, my thesis explored the change in nature of the conflict in Kashmir and the reasons that violence had escalated in recent years. So I was looking at the kind of 2010 to 2020 period, more specifically, um, and this paper that I'm talking to you today about draws on that by trying to see where climate change fits in this overall cycle of violence. So my thesis was talking about, you know, human rights abuses as an exacerbating factor and kind of security forces and all things like that. But then I was like, oh, well, you know, could we not fit in climate change somewhere into this overall cycle of violence? And does it actually worsen the situation on the ground? So my kind of sub questions or research questions that the paper tries to um, look at is, you know, does climate change impact on the conflict itself? What are the socioeconomic implications um, and what will happen with kind of future disasters? So obviously in 2022, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm sure you're all aware of the floods, but they killed up to 1,730 something people, 39 people, um, I think. Almost over 650 of those victims were children. Um, the floods caused over $14 billion worth of damage, impacted over 33 million people across Pakistan. Um, you know, they were huge, they were um, kind of catastrophic, and they were ultimately caused by climate change. So obviously what had happened was the severe um, heat wave caused the glaciers to melt, and then this caused it caused um, increased flooding in the region more than normal. Um, a state of emergency was declared in Pakistan and it became the deadliest floods in the country's history and was recorded, well, has been recorded um, as one of the most costliest natural disasters uh, to have taken place. So the disparity um, that I want to point out here is that, you know, Pakistan is facing a situation um, I was facing climate change from a point of view where they aren't actually contributing to, um, they're not one of the worst contributors to the world's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think they contribute less than 1%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yet they're experiencing kind of the most, you know, they're essentially they're in one of the most vulnerable places in the world. Um, and they're the ones that are experiencing these floods um, kind of head on. So again, you know, we can kind of interrogate that a little bit. Um, and some of the main consequences of the floods um, I've kind of highlighted on the slide, but included, you know, waterborne diseases, food, food shortages, record inflation, displacement, all of these things that I'm going to argue have a knock-on effect um, on kind of spill over to the region of Kashmir. So waterborne diseases, you know, we see things like malaria, typhoid, um, all things like that. Okay, yes. The most worst affected areas, which you can see on the map, um, are places like, you know, um, kind of southern Pakistan. But that doesn't mean that Kashmir wasn't impacted either. So I'm not trying to say that you know, it's the most worstly affected area or anything like that. Um, you can clearly see uh, the disparities in, in which areas were most affected. But what I'm trying to say and what, what I'm trying to argue that these floods have to do with Kashmir is that I'm, I think, or at least I'm um, kind of... I don't know, predicting that these these different consequences will have a knock on effect on, on the situation. So um, sorry, I just go back. So um, yeah, whether that is food shortage or inflation or displacement, which we'll get to a little bit later on, that's what I'm trying to show. I'm trying to make this connection between, okay, this is what's happened in Pakistan. This is what the floods have done. What does that have to do with um, the situation in Kashmir? So I don't have time to go into the context, unfortunately. Um, because of the time constraints of this presentation. And I'm sure you can all read about uh, Kashmir's timeline um, if you're interested in it. But basically since 1947, India and Pakistan have fought over Kashmir for various different reasons, multiple different occasions. Um, and the, the kind of region of Kashmir or the area of Kashmir remains contested. Um, so on one side, you have Indian administered Kashmir. On the other side, you have Pakistan administered Kashmir. That's a very simplified version. Um, which, you know, is problematic. But for, for now, that's all I can say. Um, and what obviously kind of since 2016 onwards and then since 2019 onwards, um, you have things like uh, the revocation of Article 370. So these kind of conflict um, hotspots, should we say, that has, you know, flowed up in the region. And then you have COVID. Um, so kind of lockdowns, increased um, instances of violence and human rights abuses, and then we get the floods. So it's not an ordinary situation where 
um, you know, the floods have kind of taken everyone by surprise and everything else was okay. Um, there was already a lot of issues going on in Kashmir and then you had the floods on top of that. Um, and what happened was, Although it didn't directly impact the situation on kind of the Indian administered side, it definitely did impact the situation on the Pakistan administered side. And I'm going to say that this has had a spillover effect. Um, you know, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, I think that if attention is kind of drawn away from the conflict, which, you know, rightly so, attention should be focused on climate change, on the disaster. Um, what happens is not only is this leaving kind of Kashmiris impoverished um, and sometimes struggling because of all the other things that are going on in the region, but also the, they're already facing um, they're already facing other issues, sorry. So when this happens, they don't have the kind of capacity or the infrastructure to then deal with a flood on top of that. So in terms of climate security, then this is making the situation worse, or at least on the surface, that's how it looks. Um, so when we see things like I mentioned in previous slides, displacement, water shortages, food shortages, um, what I think could happen is this could displace people to the periphery. It could displace them to the border region. And that border region is um, Kashmir. So then, you know, if you're if you've got a population that is displaced to a, a region that's already suffering from, you know, um, various different uh, various different issues and consequences, is that going to put more pressure on the situation in Kashmir and put more pressure on an already struggling infrastructure, which then exacerbates violence and exacerbates this kind of cycle um, that I've spoken about. One thing I can say for certain is that houses and other places of work and business were destroyed in on the uh, Kashmir on the Pakistan side of Kashmir as well. So it's not that they haven't suffered any physical consequences of the floods. They have. Um, so that's something worth noting as well. And also, third, well, at least 37 fatalities were reported as well. So, OK, yes, it's not to the same scale as, say, southern Pakistan. It's not as large scale, um, but they are suffering as a result of climate change. And climate change is, you know, or has been added to the list of ongoing problems, ongoing issues in the region, um, which then just puts more pressure on Kashmir is on the ground. And the other thing that I would say as well is if inflation is kind of taken over, you know, this record inflation that has taken place as a consequence of the floods, then, you know, what does that say for um, kind of uh, resources and attention kind of going towards say the conflict zone or even the line of control where some of these conflicts take place? Um, you know, does Pakistan have the resources um, to kind of keep up momentum or not? Um, and, you know, what will happen with things like livestock, food, um, other resources to cope with the demands of the floods. Um, in terms of future disasters, you know, it's always um, it's impossible to predict what might happen. Um, but obviously at the moment, so as in from March onwards, I think Kashmir has been dealing with kind of post winter avalanches. So, um, you know, it's likely to experience increased flooding as well. It is a very mountainous area anyway, kind of geographically. Um, so it is highly likely that these floods won't be a one off. Um, we kind of know this. Um, but what is interesting to see is, you know, will it be the more northern areas in Pakistan that start to become increasingly impacted by climate change? At the minute, we've seen that it is, you know, the kind of southern areas that have been hit the worst. But could we see this changing in, in future disasters? Um, and kind of the bottom line is that Kashmir is not exempt from the consequences of climate change. So despite the ongoing situation, despite uh, the situation that Kashmiris find themselves in, um, kind of in, in relation to the conflict, they still have to deal with the consequences of climate change, even if they don't have the resources um, or the capacity to, uh, to do that. So very quickly, I'll just wrap up because I know I'm shot when close to short time. So some preliminary conclusions then, as I said, you know, this is a working paper. Um, so I'm not quite finished with the, with the findings just yet. Um, but what I will say is, you know, despite uh, not being the worst affected area, it seems that all of these kind of consequences of the floods will spill over into Kashmir, whether that's um, just on the Pakistan side or also in the Indian administered side. Um, what the floods are doing is they're diverting attention away from the human rights crisis and some of the human rights abuses that are taking place um, in the region as well. Um, you know, ultimately, if the spillover effects do kind of fall onto uh, across the line of control, this could potentially encourage more draconian measures to be upheld and reinforced, things like lockdowns, kind of cordon and search operations, etc. 
Um, and if, you know, climate change continues to devastate Pakistan and its borderland regions, then could this ultimately kind of encourage further unrest um, and contribute to uh, this cycle of violence that I have um, researched in the past? Okay, so I will leave it there and I welcome any questions or thoughts in the Q&A session. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, there we go. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Leonie. That was very, very, um, I mean, thought provoking because uh, people probably don't think about all of these things together. But I mean, you made a very salient point there. So we look forward to more sort of maybe clarification during the Q and A. So the next speaker uh, I'd like to invite is uh, is Anushka uh, Ataullah Jan and Anushka. The stage, the metaphorical stage, is all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's go there. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Can I just get a thumbs up? Yep, perfect. Great. So thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to share a little bit of my thinking around um, the gendered health impacts of the Pakistan flood, specifically focusing on women and adolescent girls. Um, I come to this conversation today really from um, you know, a global health perspective. So I do really want to encourage anyone, if I, global health folks, we love our acronyms. So if at any point something is unclear, please do feel free to, to flag it in the chat box and I'll keep sure to, uh, you know, walk through it a little bit further or we can always discuss in the Q&A. So um, before I start, I really like to um, share a little bit about my social location. And I do this because I really believe that researchers must consistently reflect on our power and privilege. And this reflexive approach is really at the heart of the ways that I approach research. So I share my background to be more explicit on how it has informed and continues to inform my research interests and the types of questions that I ask. So um, I am a Pakhtun Pakistani um, of Pakistani descent, uh, born and raised in the Canadian context. I'm Pashto speaking, and my training, initial training, was in demography and health. I then worked in life course epidemiology and more recently have moved into qualitative methods and now really identify as a critical qualitative researcher. And what I'm going to do today is really go through a few different things. First, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, why it's really important that we take a gendered approach when looking at the Pakistani floods. Um, and thank you, Leonie, for that great uh, overview as well. So I think I can um, maybe skip some of the pieces about the, about the floods itself um, and uh, really look forward to kind of the questions, uh, question and answer period. Um, and so I'm gonna then speak about the Pakistani floods and its health impacts, specifically focusing on women and adolescent girls, and then talk about gaps and next steps, uh, and specifically some of the research that is currently underway in this area. And what I'm sharing today is really drawing on some consultations that I've been doing with the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa Provincial Disaster Management Authority, and also on an extensive literature review. So before uh, we go into really the meat of the presentation, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about the direct and indirect health impacts of climate change. So often when we are talking about the impacts of climate change, um, we are talking about the direct health impacts. And those are the deaths or entries related to heat waves or sea level rises in sea levels, changes in precipitation, such as floods and droughts, uh, like we are speaking about today. Um, but they're also really important indirect health impacts as well. And these can really um, modify the impact of climate change on health. So uh, oftentimes this means that they are worsening the impact of climate change on health, and they can work through a variety of different pathways. This can be through changing food yields. Um, so uh, in the context of what we're speaking about today, perhaps uh, through the destruction of crops, uh, reducing um, the types of crop yields, also limiting access to healthcare um, because of destruction of health infrastructures and also the fact that skilled health professionals may not be in that area because of um, a climate related disaster. Um, and then through the displacement process, if folks are being displaced, exposing them to new stressors and also display disruption of livelihoods, increased poverty and financial insecurity. 
So what I'm going to be speaking about today is mainly focusing on these indirect health impacts, which can really be long lasting in communities. So Pakistan is uh, the world's eighth most vulnerable country to climate change, according to the Climate Risk Index, um, and has some of the highest maximum temperatures globally, with many regions experiencing temperatures of over 38 degrees Celsius, um, and has a high frequency of disasters, including floods and earthquakes. Um, and the, as as was mentioned, the 22 floods in Pakistan affected approximately 33 million people. So that means about one in seven persons were affected. Uh, and this included about 650,000 pregnant women in flood affected areas. About 600,000 individuals were displaced. Um, and 8.2 million people were in need of health assistance and about 10% of health facilities were damaged and destroyed. And many of these health facilities continue to not be functional um, today. Uh, moreover, one point, uh, over 1 million houses uh, were destroyed and 2 million acres of crops were flooded. 500,000 kilometers of roads were damaged. And this includes um, about, this also includes um, a large number of bridges that uh, were destroyed, uh, 162 bridges um, and 4,000 roads that were completely uh, destroyed, um, limiting access to specific areas. Now I show you this map here so that you can see which areas were um, more affected than others. This is specifically focusing on uh, damaged houses. Um, and you can see that a lot of the damage um, related to the floods was focused on Sindh and Balochistan, but also some of it was in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Um, and this picture here uh, really demonstrates kind of this, this comparison. The picture on the left is um, in the Bahrain Bazaar uh, that I took myself in November, 2021. And this is a picture uh, not even a year later in September, 2022. So just putting that side by side so you can get an understanding of the extent of the impact. And many of these shops continue to be non-functional with most of their merchandise completely destroyed. So when we talk about um, the importance of a gendered approach, uh, part of the reason that we really emphasize this is because, um, you know, unless power is really centered in the way that we are addressing, gender, addressing uh, climate change and the systems of power are really a part of the strategies that we're using when we are distributing resources, when we are providing services to people that are affected by, um, by different climate uh, disasters, um, we can really run the risk of increasing the disparities between different populations. Uh, in the Pakistani context, of course, um, we it's really important to think about uh, the uh, inequitable social and cultural norms that can cause women to experience increased vulnerability. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in, in Pakistan, but also thinking about who has access to and control of different resources and how this can really limit their ability to respond to any type of a climate related disaster. Um, and then of course, um, women's specific health related needs. So um, recognizing this, the importance of gender, this is really a priority by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it's really centered it in part of its policies as part of its gender mainstreaming streaming approach. So um, one of the big things that when we're talking about gender in the Pakistani context is really thinking about immobility um, and how uh, mobility is closely tied to concepts of honor. And what we saw um, and what has, what has come out of some of the preliminary work that has been done by the Provincial Disaster Management Authority is that um, there were um, individuals who were women who were not able to travel to different regions um, because of um, concerns around honor and uh, concerns around the inability to maintain part of the when actually being displaced. So for this reason, many individuals actually preferred to um, go and live with extended family networks if they did have them because they weren't uh, guaranteed that in a camp or open air setting that they would be able to maintain part of the norms and that had implications for their honor and for their social and cultural um, status. Uh, and there was a lot of limited access to health services and specifically reproductive health services. Um, 
we are also seeing um, in, in Pakistan also have seen an increase in water and vector borne diseases. And part of this is related to the unhygienic living conditions that many individuals experience while displaced, but also stagnant water that continues in many, continues to persist in many areas. Um, and this has led to increase in vector borne diseases such as dengue and malaria. And there also continues to be concerns around safe drinking water. So at present, more than 10 million people lack access to safe drinking water. And this has um, led to increases in incidence of diarrhea and other waterborne diseases. And when we look at the context of malaria, we can see that there has been large increases in malaria um, in Pakistan. So a study conducted by the Global Fund in 60 districts in Pakistan found in 2021, there were about 400,000 cases of malaria. And this was um, went up to 1.6 million in 2022, which is about a four times increase um, of, of malaria. And this has really particular implications for women because malaria infection during pregnancy can actually lead to maternal anemia, miscarriage, premature delivery intrauterine growth retardation, and low birth weight infants. Menstrual hygiene has also been highlighted as a really important area um, for flood-affected women. Many women um, lacked access to toilets and segregated facilities. Um, and uh, because of that, um, many uh, continued um, using practices that, uh, that were actually very dangerous for them. So because they did not have access to sanitary products, use of plastic bags, leaves, newspapers, and other damp rags and cloths. Um, this was also a, sh uh, a shameful and stigmatized uh, topic. So there were in certain cases, resistance to distribution of products such as hygiene kits in specific geographies. Um, as many male community members said that this wasn't a priority um, for them and their communities. Um, what has also been, um, uh, what is also coming out of some of the work in Pakistan is that there was an increased risk of sexual and physical violence and trafficking. So we know that the process of displacement disrupts access to safety networks because individuals through that displacement process are often separated from other members of their family and also just the general community. They're with new individuals um, in a different, uh, especially if you're in an open air camp setting. Um, and, um, you know, increased uncertainty and fear can often also lead to increased incidence of intimate partner violence and violence experienced from other male family members, and also increased sexual exploitation for resources such as money and food. Um, and gender actually was not in the in the context of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, gender was actually not really incorporated in um, the way that many of the resources were actually distributed to communities. So there were uh, uh, lots of experiences of gender-based violence while women were trying to go to um, gather uh, you know, food at food distribution points. Many of them did experience, uh, did experience violence in those contexts. Um, we know from other humanitarian settings that early marriage does tend to often also increase in these types of contexts. And we don't have evidence on what this looks like from the 2022 floods, but we know that from the 2010 floods that these that um, marriage rates for adolescent girls went up from 10 to 16 percent. So it is quite possible that we will see similar patterns coming out from some of the data in the Pakistani uh, from the 2022 floods. Food insecurity continues to be a persistent uh, concern with about 6 million people experiencing high levels of acute food insecurity. And this has specific nutrition impacts on women and girls. And this is partly related to the gendered feeding pat patterns. Um, and specific uh, families will experience um, these nutrition impacts more with uh, female headed households experiencing increased um, food insecurity. And Pakistan already has high maternal mortality and high rates of malnutrition, particularly childhood stunting. So this can really continue to, to wor worsen it. And malnutrition is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality in Pakistan. So we also know that education, um, uh, many schools were closed um, during, the, during the floods, many continue to be closed and many of the districts that were affected, hit worse by flooding were areas where about one third of girls and boys were already out of school. Um, whether adolescent girls will now enroll again in school is not really, is not really clear. 
Um, and I'm just going to power through this because I think we're getting close to time. Um, when uh, when there was um, the when the Kabupaten Kwa government was actually working uh, to um, you distribute things to women that individuals that were affected by the floods in Kabupaten Kwa, there was not a needs assessment done. So this meant that many adolescent girls and women did not actually receive any kind of financial remuneration for any of their informal labor or revenue generating activities. And we are also hearing about increased property damage, leading many uh, families to um, actually deny women their inheritance rights. So there are lots of gaps in the research related to some of our understanding around indirect uh, flood related morbidity mortality and specifically the long term impacts and the impacts on communities that experience multiple levels of marginalization. Um, and also really understanding how communities kind of adapt to this as well. So my current work is actually really uh, addressing this and I'm currently doing um, some primary qualitative uh, research in uh, Swat Valley, specifically trying to answer these questions and address some of these gaps and really dive into some of the topics that I um, shared uh, during the presentation. Uh, and to finish off, I wanted to share these pictures. The picture on the right is actually a picture from yesterday from Bahrain Swat in Swat Valley. Um, and you can see that there is extensive flooding and this is, we haven't really gotten into the rainy season. So there are lots of concerns about what 2023 is going to look for this region and the National Disaster Management Authority in Pakistan has already predicted that there will be a 72% chance of devastating floods. So this is quite concerning and really means that gender needs to be really centered in how we are responding to these floods in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anushka. That was, I mean, such a, I mean, sobering insight into what's happening. And uh, um, I would, um, so I think we'll have some really good Q&A um, time later on. Uh, um, I am very pleased to invite uh, Vikash Chetri and uh, I would first of all like to thank him in case he is joining us from Cape Town. This is pretty late in Cape Town and it's also late for Leonie, but I think it's even later for Vikash. So we are going to shift focus now, geographical focus from like Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Azad Kashmir to the diametrically opposite side to Assam and Bangladesh. And I'm personally very excited because this is about my home state in India. So, Vikash, I welcome you. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fine. Uh, and can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. We can. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the... Um, for, for inviting me to this uh, symposium. Um, right now I'm in India. Actually, I'm, um, I'm gonna start my field work in a few days. Um, so uh, just to give you an, a brief idea, uh, this uh, work is an extension of what I did in, in uh, my MPhil. And um, I'm expanding the, in not only the area of my research, which was largely focused on Majuli, the largest riverine island um, in, in, in the state of Assam. Um, I'm expanding this research to um, the nearby district, um, uh, Dhimaji, which is, again, uh, both the districts are perennially affected by flood and uh, riverbank erosion. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I have I have grown up in in, in this particular area. So uh, so most of my research has been based on my own lived experience and what I have witnessed while growing up, as well as the kind of shift that has happened uh, throughout time. So um, as I've mentioned, that uh, flood um, and riverbank erosion have 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 been part and parcel of everyday lives of of uh, Assamese uh, uh, community, and um, because. Uh, uh, more than 40, approximately 40% of the area um, uh, in Assam is, is flood prone, which is um, four times more than the national average. And um, as per the, uh, I mean, as per the um, uh, um, Assam State Disaster Management Authority's report, uh, both the district that I've chose uh, for my research are, uh, are one of the worst affected areas. Uh, and and uh, more than 40 to 50 percent of the area is is flood prone in these areas as um as um as as the repair community uh, in in these areas have been living with uh, uh, with these uh, floods forever uh, they have uh, they have in a way learned 
to bear these ep episodic flood, um, but not quite to cope with the extraordinary inundation. Uh, however, we see how the communities, primarily uh, missing communities or deuris or the indigenous community, or not only the indigenous community, but also um, uh, I mean, um, also the Assamese community have tried to bend with uh with 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 flood and and or uh, as at the same time rise again uh with this yearly flood um and 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 it is important uh, uh for me to contextualize that a river in in context of assam in 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 or in nearby um uh, states um emerges in different forms uh, or different co connotations it has different connotations like a uh, flood uh, flood in in assam is not only seen as uh, as an sign of a uh, 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 signpost of a uh, de uh, destroyer but at the same time it's it, it's seen as an uh, um as an as an sense of, uh, of something which which creates uh, a lot of uh, opportunities uh, why i'm saying this because um while growing up we um, and my family we used to get excited uh, 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 because of the yearly flood because the yearly floods every year carries the amount, I mean, good amount of pollock or alluvian soil, which is uh, which is ideal for uh, for paddy cultivation. At, at the same time, fishing, which is an important source of livelihood uh, in areas like Majuli or areas like uh, uh, Dhimaji and other areas in Assam. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, flood also takes away a lot of a uh, lo uh, lot of resources which the community owns. Primarily, when we talk about Majuli, it's 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 um, it's um, the land that has been gradually diminishing year after year. And um, uh, so, so um, um, and, and at the same time, how, how in this particular riverine island, uh, floods and riverbank erosion have re-theorized the livelihood practices uh, uh, from people who have been uh, traditionally potter or, or pot, uh, were engaged in pottery making are forced to shift uh, to other forms of livelihood. Uh, like sharecropping or or the uh, uh, fishermen were forced to do uh, goat rearing or goat trading. So so these are the kind of shift that we have seen and and the kind of shift that has brought by um, by, by floods in in these area. So um, um, uh, so so it is important that uh, how uh, often the rhythm uh, of of um, rhythm against which the ruler population in Majuli or Dhimaji. Have have organized their economic and cultural activity now uh, with with time and with with the kind of uh, uh, intervention in the state uh, by the state. These rhythm has been broken due to the hydro social cycles uh, being interrupted. A society which was earlier uh, flood dependent have rendered flood vulnerable. So uh, so um, uh, with with these uh, with these idea in mind, like I I large, I, I largely try to look at how um, um, how 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 floods have have in a way pushed um, uh, or or um, or to explore the kind of inequality faced by the community due to disappearance of mati or land uh, and uh, jivika or livelihood uh, due to the twin processes of of flood and riverbank erosion. So. Um, so this is the area um, uh, that I'm talking about. It, uh, Assam is uh, located in the, on, uh, in the northeastern part of India. And as you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, this is the island that I'm talking about. It is one of the largest river and island, which is encircled by Brahmaputra, as well as uh, other two tributaries, Kerkitya Suti and Suban City. While on the other hand, on the right-hand side, uh, this is another district oh, very ad adjacent to, uh, uh, to Majuli, uh, it, it, it is, um, I mean, which gets inundated a year, year after year due to floods, uh, 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 due to floods, um, uh, um, due to floods in, in, in these area. So um, uh, while at the same time, it is very important to look at the kind of interventions that has been happening in the state. Uh, if you, if, uh, even if you look at uh, the interventions of the state during the Ahun Kingdom or in the, uh, in, in the colonial times or in the post-colonial times have most of the flood control measures in the state have been focusing on uh, creating uh, hydro um, uh, or, or uh, creating um, um, infrastructure uh, which is largely to uh, which is largely to control or tame the river through through these different interventions as as um, 
um, as these structures like uh, dikes or embankment have, um, have also in a way reduced the space between Brahmaputra and the tributaries uh, to uh, the wetlands or ponds, uh, these, these infrastructures uh, uh, creates uh, uh, obstruction between the water bodies. Hence, during the monsoon months, the water which uh, the water gets overtopped from these embankments leading to uh, breaches regularly. So, so it, it, is, it becomes very important for us to look at these infrastructures, um, um, uh, uh, not only from a perspective of, of, of our signpost of development, but also a signpost for precarity, uh, which can be established by the fact that uh, recently, uh, in, in recent times, we have seen the number of deaths or the number of loss in these areas were largely uh, be uh, largely uh, caused due uh, not uh, caused by the natural uh, flooding, but uh, due to the breakage of these uh, signposts or um, um, or infrastructure. So uh, so um, and and it's very important to look at how these um, infrastructures have created two zones within the same area. Like uh, oh, this is already uh, this has already been spoken by many scholars, like um, uh, Mithul Borua, who is from the I uh, who is from who has uh, recently come up with a book called Slow Disaster, wherein he sees how, um, uh, how embankments have created two zones within the same island and, uh, and, and have divide, in a way divided uh, uh, the people of, 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 these, um, uh, of the islands. So uh, the first zone, um, which he on, and I also call it as an inside zone, uh, where, which, uh, 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 wherein most of these important uh, landmarks like uh, government offices or Hotra, which is basically a Vaishnavite monasteries, as um, some of you might be aware that uh, the whole neo-Vaishnavism movement started from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the whole neo-Vaishnavism movement started from uh, uh, Majuli, and uh, it is one of the cultural hub of Assam. So, uh, so, so, so the inside zone consists of these uh, 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 these important sites uh, primarily, and and the second zone, uh, which I called as uh, other zone or the outside zones, are located outside the limits of the embankment, and which uh, which is perennially affected uh, uh, or exposed uh, more uh, uh, to to uh, floods, and uh, most of these uh, location or the most of these. Uh, other zone constitute uh, people who are uh, from the uh, uh, who who are who are marginalized, largely people belonging to uh, missing community or uh, koiborthos, uh, which uh, uh, they are a scheduled caste or who are, who are primarily engaged in fishing. They constitute uh, uh, or they are uh, they are the uh, uh, they, they they are the primary uh, constituencies who are living in this other zone. So um, uh, so. Uh, so uh, though, uh, though, though, the uh, though the creation of these uh, kind of hydraulic infrastructure have in a way reduced some, uh, some form of impact uh, of disasters uh, uh, within the inside zones. However, flooding in the inside zones have become more, disaster, um, uh, more uh, disastrous due to breaching of these signposts as, um, as, as largely um, uh, these infrastructures have confined the course of water and uh, when, the ex uh, when the excessive waters, uh, uh, I mean, when uh, these um, infrastructure could not bear the excessive waters, which gets accumulated, uh, uh, um, which, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, largely due to the breakage of these uh, infrastructures leads to a, a long lasting impact on, on, on um, the, uh, on the area, uh, on the inside zones. So um, uh, while uh, while I was conducting my field, uh, um, uh, while I was conducting my field work uh, during MPhil, uh, one of the respondent uh, uh, said, and I quote her: uh, "The embankment in the area which where she lives, um, um, it gets less inundated or flooded. However, when the embankment breaches, the whole re uh, area or the whole uh, whole area gets submerged underwater." Uh, she adds, uh, flooding in the area is not due to river water or Brahmaputra directly, rather it is due to indirect flooding caused, uh, caused either due to the breach of embankment or encroachment of water bodies which are converted uh, for infrastructural projects. Um, um, about the breach in safe, uh, safety due to a breakage of infrastructure development, uh, another respondent uh, who lived uh, in, in the inside zone said, and I quote, 
uh, we were better off without the creation of these infrastructure or, we, or what we call it, uh, what we call metauris or embankment. Uh, it, it in a way creates a false narrative among the community or a sense for, for a sense of security or safety. As every year uh, this gets break and most of the embankment, as most of the embankment, while the earlier speaker whom I also talked, uh, talked about how, uh, if, uh, how these infrastructures are poorly constructed, which leads to a larger destruction. While on the other hand, um, the other zone or uh, the outside zone has uh, in a way created a permanent problem of flooding in this area as, as when, uh, when, uh, when, when the water rises, it can enter the, it, it can't enter the mainland or the inside zones due to obstruction. Uh, and, and most of these inside zones constitutes the uh, constitutes ponds or the bill where wherein the excessive water earlier used to get accumulated now due to these infrastructure uh, the water uh, is is uh, getting obstructed so um i'm so sorry but we've crossed the time mark if you can just sum up in the next two minutes Thank oh you. yeah sure yeah yeah sure so um so um um i i'll, I'll quickly go through uh, how um how um in, in this particular island, uh, primarily, uh, or or in in uh, for a matter of fact, um, in um, um, in 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 uh, Majuli, uh, the the question of land becomes uh, very important because, um, as uh, Lee, uh, who pointed out uh, in 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 her work, uh, and he says in an article, land uh, being in, uh, he uh, she uh, mentioned that uh, land is a strange object which stays in one place. Uh, which stays in one place and it, it cannot be removed. However, her acknowledgement of land in Brahmaputra Valley fails as land instead of staying in one place is continuously eroding and, uh, uh, and which is uh, constantly diminishing, which is in a way has impacted, it has impacted the traditional forms of livelihood. On, as you can see, most, uh, in most of the people, or primarily the women uh, are uh, from the island, uh, from, from this particular island are engaged in uh, traditional pottery making, and uh, due to due to rampant uh, 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 floods and riverbank erosion, the kind of soil that has been required, which we call it uh, Kumar Mati, uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the potters are not getting the kind of soil which is required, largely uh, largely because the uh, river have started carrying more of a sand or lodha mati which is not ideal for pottery making so hence uh, many uh, many uh, villages which were named after uh, their traditional livelihood pattern like uh, dokkinpat kumalgao most of these villages have lost their traditional livelihood pattern and now they have shifted to another forms of livelihood like uh, goat rearing uh, share cropping and so on and so forth so um uh, and and at the same time uh, at the same time, uh, 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 mass making uh, uh, is also one of an important source of um, of, of uh, livelihood uh, for for uh, people belonging to Samoguri Sotras. Uh, again, they uh, due to uh, the inferior quality of of, of uh, um, um, soil that they receive uh, that they get these days, uh, they are not able to produce the high quality mass, which is in a way deteriorating. Uh, uh, the age-old uh, practices. Because I think we should, uh, I will have to ask you to stop here. I'm sorry, just because we need to also give time to our last speaker. So maybe we'll get a chance to come back to some of these points in the Q&A. So, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Okay. So I uh, can I get yeah. quickly one second uh, to wind up? Okay, just literally, I mean, five seconds. Uh, yeah. Five. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, all right. So, so, so it's important that, uh, uh, as I um, as I mentioned, that um, it's it's important that uh, Brahmaput uh, as as Brahmaputra and other rivers are very uh, delicate. It it should so so one of the respondents said, and I quote: uh, "It should be uh, most of these rivers should be touched with love and care, and it is important that whatever infrastructure or technocratic development that is planned." Uh, uh, it needs to be, uh, and, and so it is important that uh, the people's lives and livelihood uh, needs to be the center of these kind of interventions that are being planned by the state. So uh, thank you so much, and I'm sorry uh, for taking uh, more time. To... Thank you, Bikash. Okay. Um, all right, so over to our last speaker. And uh, so Bikash is already, he's, he mentioned he's doing his field work in India, he's there, and I think our next speaker is about to head to do his field work. 
very soon. So welcome, Daniel, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> So um, <clears throat> greetings, uh, aloha kako. So thank you for joining my uh, presentation. As you may have heard from uh, Dr. Ashok Das earlier, I'm a geography PhD student, PhD student at our host institution, UH Manoa. Uh, this presentation, however, is gonna be based on uh, field research that I conducted for my master's thesis, thesis in 2019 in uh, Cal Poly Humboldt in California which focused on um, the social movements to protect transboundary rivers in Bangladesh and regional watershed cooperation in South Asia. Um, <clears throat> so as many of us know, Bangladesh and the Bengal Delta are identified as one of the most climate vulnerable regions in the world. Um, dominant, dominant discourses about climate action in the region, however, are limited to sea level rise and cyclones triggered by a warming climate. In this presentation, however, I'm gonna be highlighting the role of South Asia's common rivers and Bangladesh's deltaic geography for climate and environmental justice advocacy. Um, so uh, this map of South Asia helps visualize the importance of rivers to Bangladesh, which sits at the terminal floodplain delta of the transboundary Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna rivers. So this here is the Ganges River, which begins in the Indian Himalayas before flowing south and eastwards across the plains of the northern part of the country. And over here is the Brahmaputra River, which begins in Tibet and eventually empties into, um, enters into India and then empties out into the Bay of Bengal through Bangladesh. And then this river system here is the Migna River, which also comes from Northeast India and empties out into the Bay of Bengal through Bangladesh. And the place where all these three rivers converge before dispersing into the Bay of Bengal is called the Bengal Delta, most of which falls under the boundaries of Bangladesh. And in fact, there's a popular na national saying in Bangladesh that visualizes the country's deltaic set setting and identity around these three river systems. Our address is the Padma Meghna Jamuna rivers. Padma and, Jamuna River. Padma and Jamuna are the names of the main distributaries of the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers, respectively, within Bangladesh. And the importance of rivers in the country was manifested in the 2019 Bangladesh Supreme Court um, decision, which declared all waterways flowing through the country as living entities with legal rights. This decision, which detailed government uh, detailed instructions to government and agencies to combat local pollution, river pollution and encroachment by state and business actors stands out as being one of the most uh, comprehensive river rights frameworks in the world. And four years have passed since this court verdict, but a question that I and many others still have is how effective is giving legal personhood to rivers in a Delta a country where over 90% of the river water originates from outside the boundaries. What are its implicate? What are the implications in the life of transboundary rivers, which, as I'll elaborate later on in this presentation, play a major role in building climate and environmental resilience in the Bengal Delta? In upper riparian countries like India, the course of transboundary rivers is hampered by dams and other large developmental inter interventions, such as the one depicted here, uh, which is the Faraka Barrage, which was commissioned in 19, 1975. And it's just situated eight miles upstream of the India-Bangladesh border and diverts 50% of the flow from the main stem of the Ganges River into the Hooghly River distributary in the state of West Bengal during the dry season. And Bangladesh and India have they, they they both share 54 enlisted transboundary rivers, and but the vast majority of them fall outside of existing bilateral water sharing agreements. There's no multilateral mechanism or global framework for the protection of transboundary rivers, such as the 1997 
uh, water course, UN water courses convention, which is not active in South Asia, in South Asian countries. And the response of Bangladeshi civil society and environmental groups to the state of transboundary rivers is specifically what I explored in my 2019 field study. And I did this primarily through an ethnographic approach, which featured semi-structured interviews and participant observations with uh, major environmental civil society groups in the capital city of Dhaka. And I also used a grounded theory methodology to analyze interview data and relevant gray literature from, as well as visuals collected from the field. And a recurring theme in my engagements with civil society was an emphasis on Bangladesh's livelihoods and ecologies hanging on the line due to the scale of upstream river and floodplain interventions, as well as the country's downstream climate vulnerability. And uh, a striking example of this, you know, a striking example highlighting the scale of Bangladesh's downstream climate vulnerability was this demonstration held by the civil society group uh, called Riverine People in uh, October 2018, which was just just shortly after the UN, the UN's Intergovernmental Pal Panel on Climate Change declared to the world that we had until the year 2030 for global war warming to be kept to a, mi a minimum or to a maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And following this grave news, Riverine people, uh, they staged this demonstration on the Buriganga River in Dhaka, addressing that Bangladesh's rivers and riverine communities are on the front lines of the climate crisis. And in a press statement, the group secretary general specifically stated that rivers, which cradle between the Himalaya mountains and the Bay of Bengal, as well as their dependent communities are the first victim of climate change. This expression also came up in several of my field interviews. Field interviews. Many of my interviewees stated that, that the ability to pursue local climate action and, and adaptation in Bangladesh is complicated by upstream river dams and diversionary intervention structure, structures. For instance, a representative of the group Bangladesh Poribesh Andalan noted that monsoon season floods commonplace in the Bengal Delta will be further exacerbated by upstream dams like the Faraka Barrage, which blocks river flows into the country during the dry season and are left open during the wet monsoon months. And a representative from another civil society group, the Bangladesh Environment Network, added an additional layer to this argument. Bangladesh has been getting about half of the waterborne sediment that rivers used to carry since the 1960s as a result of these dams. And he noted that Bangladesh is a delta is a delta country and sedimentation is a is at the heart of the, the delta building process. Low river flow into Bangladesh impacts agriculture, industry, navigation, and irrigation, but on a much broader scale, it hampers the delta building process. The, the unilateral diversion of water and sediment in upstream countries in the face of climate change manifested by sea level rise and cyclones is also being amplified is also amplifying the destructiveness of floods, erosion, and subsistence, as well as land loss in Bangladesh. Two of my interviewees in particular stated that environmental refugees in Bangladesh are refugees only partially because of climate because of uh, global climate change and that it would be just as accurate to call them, if not more accurate, to call them river refugees. And while all of this sounds very daunting for Bangladesh, it also highlights the reciprocal relationship of its delta ge geography to South Asia as a whole. This was the takeaway message from my encounter with the civil society group by the name of Broti. Um, I was particularly moved by how the representative framed Bangladesh as being on the front lines of environmental justice based on its regional significance for the management of water. She identified Deltaic Bangladesh as the cradle and link to the ocean for South Asian rivers, visualizing the region's negligence of managing common rivers from source to sea, 
she, she specifically chose to use the word cradle as it reframes the status ter territorialization and politicization of South Asia and its river under, under an ecological banner. And she, it, this statement also clarifies Bangladesh's position on the front lines of the region's shared geography. And metaphorically, the cradle is the, the child that sleeps in the mother's lap. And Bangladesh is the lap for this whole region, she said. The Deltaic nation cradles the waters of the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Meghna rivers. And if the cradle is destroyed, rivers will not live. Therefore, rivers must be allowed to flow to the ocean. Her, her visually striking depictions of Bangladesh's Deltaic setting showcase the importance of collab collaborating with co riparian neighbors and is being echoed by civil society groups mobilizing across and beyond geopolitical borders. Global coalition building to protect transboundary rivers is exemplified by international rivers campaign to protect the Brahmaputra River Basin uh, with civil society and state actors across Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, and India. So I'll conclude, conclude this presentation by noting that Bangladesh is um, setting as the lowest riparian and deltaic country and in the region, as well as rel relative um, political po power and regional political power in regional and global affairs has been prompting local civil society groups to forge relationships with diaspora communities. For example, Bangladesh Environment Network depicted here um, Many of their most prominent members are based in the United States, and they offer intellectual and fiscal support to the Bangladesh Bori Beshandalan, which is the, the country's largest environmental group. And I personally learned about the movements to protect Bangladesh through my own involvement with the California-based group Brown and Green, South Asian Americans for Climate Justice in 2014. That year, a contingent of us traveled to New York City to join the Bangladesh Environment Network and other South Asian American community groups for the People's Climate March ahead of a major UN climate summit. Others held a parallel demonstration in Oakland, California. And while the goal of our joint mobilization was having global decision makers take action on addressing the climate crisis for um, for, di for diasporic groups like the Bangladesh Environment Network and their on-the-ground counterparts in South Asia, climate action is was inseparable from their advocacy for a basin-wide ecological approach to the region's common rivers. And that's all for now. And I look forward to your um, feedback or questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so I think we have um, four very interesting, we just had four very interesting presentations on a large swath of uh, issues. And I think uh, we already have a couple of questions. We welcome more questions. It'll be nice to keep them brief so that um, our presenters also could, I mean, answer more pointedly. So anyway, so let me just, uh, I think you can probably see the questions also. Um, so I think the first question is, I think towards, uh, I think it's directed for Anushka is um, very interesting research and very much aligned to my area of research in Bangladesh. In case of menstruation product needs, you see the disaster intervention programs, like relief programs include menstruation products as a basic need. Another question, how the veil of Parada played a role in adaptation to flood and how do such sociocultural and religious norms, uh, how are they contested? And negotiated in these emergencies and i think the second question is sort of related and you could probably see it anushka i won't read the whole thing but i think uh you could probably answer and if anyone else wants to jump in also to answer on these uh, answer these questions you're welcome yeah thank you yeah great so thank you for these two really interesting questions um so the first set of questions from um janat um yeah, menstrual hygiene products were a part of the way that um, some humanitarian organizations, such as UNFPA, um, what they did distribute. So they did distribute dignity kits, which did have menstrual hygiene pro products. But a lot of the efforts around um, distributing menstrual hygiene products were actually done by um, sort of independent community members that mobilized at the start of the floods. There was actually large calls 
there's, you know, a group out of Sindh, Mawahari Justice, and they've been like really pushing in Sindh, really um, trying to get products to flood affected uh, women. So there, there has been, um, you know, sort of some acknowledgement that it is important, but it isn't always necessarily prioritized. And also what happens is that if there are a list of different things that need to be distributed to communities, that's not always the one that is kind of really the one that is emphasized. Um, and so um, the other question around uh, Vale and Pertha. Yeah, this is really interesting because I think it played a really big role in uh, the choice of where families wanted to go when they were thinking about um, having to leave their homes because many, um, many families, because of the part of the norms and where they didn't want, uh, you know, non-familial men to be able to see them in a type of a camp setting, there's no way to really be able to avoid that in that same way. Uh, so many of them chose to go to relatives' homes if they had that opportunity. And what that actually did was that it ended up um, kind of increasing the disparities between those that had access to resources, um, because many times when we're talking about class and caste, it is like sort of family networks that are in similar kind of uh, socioeconomic status. So um, individuals who kind of had um, access to family networks that had means um, they could go there and they could uh, be, be with them and individuals that had no other options were the ones who were going to this camp in open air settings. Um, and then this question from Yaz, thank you very much about um, how we promote gen gender sensitive and rights based approaches. I think uh, first and foremost, it's including women in um, our assessments and our consultations. I think it is very telling that uh, women weren't a part of the needs assessments in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and without us even having an understanding of what the needs of these communities are, um, how can we even begin to start the conversation about how to address them? So really having women at the table, having those conversations uh, would be kind of the first, the first step. Um, but I'll stop there so I can give other folks a chance to also uh, share. Thank you. Sure. Is if anyone else wants to also maybe even though that's not the main focus, I mean add to this or any other questions, uh, we would welcome those. Um, if not, yeah, go ahead, Anna, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question which is for both Pikash and Daniel, but I think anybody can also um, add their thoughts to this question. Um, I was struck by the things that both of you mentioned about the infrastructural causes of so much um, devastation from floods when floods traditionally have been um, welcomed and dealt with by local communities. And I guess we didn't hear so much of the same kind of discussion regarding Pakistan, but for those of you who are researching Pakistan, I am wondering if there are these same kinds of engagement with rivers. But what my question really is for um, Daniela and Bikas, is Bikash mentioned treating the rivers with love and care. And Daniel mentioned um, that in Bangladesh, the rivers have been given, I believe, legal personhood or recognition um, that they have rights. So in between um, this major legal framework and the community level where there is recognition kind of at the top and the bottom that the rivers do need to be treated with love and care and the people who live with them know a lot of the ways to do that. How do you think we can, well, we, anyone, these people can um, educate the middle, <laughs> the people who are um, the local policy makers and people who are um, maybe super local policy makers who are creating these infrastructures, which are maybe um, not having the intended objectives. Should I yeah. go first? Oh, okay. You can go, Vikash. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, uh, in, in case of, in case of Marjorie, in case, I mean, I'm primarily working on this community, which, um, uh, 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 which is called a missing community. So uh, they are in river and community, right? And uh, if, if you look at um, the kind of um, interventions or the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, um, traditional uh, or indigenous way of coping from flood, 
from that particular community have been aiding the community to cope from disasters. And uh, I mean, and and the, the I mean, it has been widely acknowledged by the civil society how the missing community or Devri community who live closer to the river have 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 been their life. Uh, while uh, I mean, which which I mean, uh, we, we in 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 time uh, time and time again we we see that uh, uh, the Assam Disaster Management Authority. Do, does acknowledge the kind of interventions these river and community do in order to cope from flood. But when it comes to implementation, when it comes to hearing their voice, they, 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 they don't find places in policy making. And, and um, uh, it, it, it is largely, uh, 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 largely because uh, uh, in, in most of these forums or most of these um, 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 policy makers, uh, um, Tend to tend to overlook uh, uh, tend to overlook the indigenous uh, coping mechanism and tend to or uh, in most of the time they don't have uh, these constituencies as part of the decision making bodies. Um, while uh, while uh, in recent times what we have seen, uh, uh, particularly Brahmaputra board, uh, which uh, which is in a way um, uh, have 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 been uh, um, have have been doing interventions in the state. Have acknowledged and uh, and and have said how um, I mean and how uh, the river and communities uh, I mean um, how the traditional infrastructures or or um, uh, their life um, sorry uh, the agricultural pattern for that matters find places and and they have recommended to Assam government also that how um, uh, traditional paddies like ahu or baudhan needs to be uh, needs to be uh, encouraged or needs to be promoted. Because these uh, the crops, uh, the, the two crops that I mentioned um, uh, are, are flood resilient crops. So, um, so, so, uh, so, so, but, but, uh, but at the, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, but uh, these kind of interventions or these kind of acknowledgement are very minimal, uh, and and um, uh, in in uh, in in, uh, in most of the interventions that are being done by the state. Uh, um yeah I, I think that's what i can think of right now uh thanks yeah. Vikash, I think, yeah daniel yeah yeah in in my experience um like in my presentation i i noted how like civil society for civil society this is um it's clearly acknowledged that these interventions are not a good thing and what I've been looking at a lot more as as a PhD student, and this will probably be more of a focus in my in my uh, dissertation project, which I'm currently working on, is the history, the colonial history of uh, South Asia. Like a lot of the the literature that I've been looking at shows that these interventions and like the the effects, the the effects that uh, that are caused by these interventions have been documented for at least two centuries two three centuries and and it's being a lot of the same thing is happening under you know post-colonial india and bangladesh and in other parts of the world so i think it has a lot to do with you know what's um <clears throat> Uh, it's it's a much larger larger problem around the world. Uh, uh, like there's this there's this privileging of fixed land and not um, not uh, not an acceptance of the fluidity of you know for example deltaic they'll take uh, spaces like the Bengal Delta, where people have traditionally moved, um, you know, back and forth, you know, as, you know, in the monsoon season, people would live in a certain place. And then during the dry season, people would move somewhere else. And there's been, since the colonial era, privileging of fixed land and, uh, you know, and which is seen as modern, 
and um and this this and i think with uh the acceleration of the climate crisis in the region maybe that might be the impetus for a new approach to rivers in the region yeah thanks daniel i think that's a very very good answer and again gives us food for thought um so i posed a question to the presenters i mean so i mean the problems that you outlined i mean within the larger scheme of things um so do you see what are some spaces of optimism that you notice which might not be as visible or noticeable to the others yet you know in a way yeah Shall I... yeah, you can start, yeah, Loyan, you can start yeah. um yeah i thought it was quite an interesting question because it is very much doom and gloom some of the things we've been talking about um but it kind of provoked me to think actually because i made the point about um you know climate change and the floods diverting attention away from the conflict and that could potentially be a bad thing because of resources and things like that um but i think it could also have the potential to be a positive thing and um, what i mean by that is you know if you know if we, if we think about security and i argued very much this, during my phd is that we need to focus more on human security but instead of state security so this kind of moving away from you know realist understandings of what security looks like and it's all about the security of the state and actually shifting towards this kind of human-centered individual-centered security approach and i think climate change although yes it's very bad it's doom and gloom um it might be a way into that to say okay you know we need to focus less about the potential for nuclear war or god knows what else but more towards what are the actual daily issues that individuals are facing and that is climate change, you know, that's the issue on the ground. OK, yes, we do have this whole conflict going on and, you know, there might be human rights abuses and there might be violence taking place every day. But if attention was diverted, kind of not necessarily away from that, but more focus on the kind of imminent threat of climate change, would that, I don't know, have some influence and say, OK, well, maybe we should focus less on state security and more on the human security of indiv individuals that are caught up in these, you know, catastrophes of floods, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not necessarily um, either or, I'm not saying, okay, we need to just forget about the conflict and focus on climate change, but it might have that kind of unintentional impact, um, particularly when we're thinking about stakeholders and decision makers to say, well, actually, um, instead of spending so much time and money and attention um, on weapons and whatever else, we could actually spend more time um, in disaster management. So it, you know, it might it might just have that flip, uh, kind of flip side effect. Hopefully. Thanks. Anyone can go next. Yeah, we can just. We have about ten minutes, till thirteen minutes still to go. Yeah. So, oh, oh, sorry, three minutes. Sorry, sorry. Oh, three minutes. My mistake. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe one minute each. Yeah, please. Yeah, sure. So I'll keep it really brief, but I think that one of the things that I find um, as a place of optimism is really um, like kind of approaching this with a strengths-based approach. So communities are already um, thinking about some of these, um, you know, issues and uh, questions, and they are using strategies um, as a way to support each other. And you know, in the Pakistani context, when we think about the floods and think about the Mahabi Pakhtunkhwa and the amount of bridges that were destructed, uh, destroyed, means that there were many communities that were cut off from, you know, the from other aid agencies, and so communities kind of gathered together to support each other. So, really thinking about how can we um, learn from what communities are already doing and take those to um, adapt because I think we are at the state where it's really about adaption at, at this point and adapting to like the, the new realities that um, may be uh, unfortunate, but um, don't have to necessarily have the same level of health impacts that we are seeing today. I Thank think you. I just wanna jump on the back of that because I think as well, we underestimate how resilient some of these communities are. You know, we do look at it constantly from this negative angle of, of kind of victimization and things like that, which is all necessarily true. Um, but also we kind of underestimate how resilient some of these communities are in actually dealing with it. Um, and they become a lot more equipped than certain areas in the world when it comes to kind of disaster management, which I think maybe perhaps they don't get enough credit for as well. Okay, very quickly, I think, Daniel and Bikash, if you have, yeah. Yeah, just to, uh, just to add what uh, Anushka and Leonie said, like how communities, uh, I mean, 
uh, these disasters uh, give an avenue uh, to look at uh, traditional, in, I mean, indigenous knowledge system and how how the communities, how uh, the indigenous communities or non-indigenous communities primarily living in these uh, geographies have relied on their indigeneity to cope from flood and, and learn from one another rather than trying to fight with the river, they try to bend, as I mentioned earlier as well. Um, and and uh, devising an innovative way, like uh, I remember how a ham radio uh, or, or a community, um, uh, uh, I mean, ham radio or community radio systems have been used in very important tool to communicate uh, within, within Majuli and within SOAR areas, which is a small island within within Majuli. And, and uh, they have devised these innovative practices by inculcating uh, not only the technocratic approach, but also the traditional way of how they used to cope by not only looking at, um, um, uh, I mean, the flow of river or or the certain sounds of, of animals like frog, primarily the community that I mentioned, missing community, they observe these patterns of, of uh, animals to, to um, uh, uh, to, to uh, I mean, the flow of river and so on and so forth have been used uh, to to predict flood. So that is a, a, a way of 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 uh, looking at. I I think. Um, yeah. Thanks, Bukash. Daniel, last word. <laughs> yes, I'm really inspired. I think there's a, a lot of interest both in the community level as well as in academia in more fluid and liminal notions of space. And you know, as I argue in my uh, argued in my presentation, like a big part of the the problem in the Bengal Delta is, you know, the geopolitical boundaries between Bangladesh and India, which exacerbate and, uh, you know, the difference, the different um, ex the river degradation in the region. And I, by fluid notions of space, I'm not just talking about geo, you know. Um, geopolitical boundaries, but also like the boundary between land and water. And that I think is also um, like a lot of these dams and the, the privileging of embankments and fixed land, it's, it's in many ways rooted in, you know, this idea of fixed land. And I think, as I mentioned before, like there's just, um, a, a very a wide interest in more fluid notions of space and territoriality. And that's what I'm trying to focus on in my dissertation. Thank you, Daniel. So I think we must end it here. And so I want to just mention, uh, I mean, heartfelt thanks to all of you for giving, taking us on this fascinating journey from Azad Kashmir to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to, to Assam and then to Bangladesh. And uh, let's hope that human ingenuity and sort of the untapped potentials at in grassroots communities within these fluid sp spaces will will sort of show us a path out of this seemingly i mean somewhat i mean intractable mess right now so thank you so much and i wish you all good luck in your respective research endeavors and hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the conference so thank you so much bye thank you bye thank you